Hello and welcome everyone. But right now we have two of our very Helen Hayes worthy designers who have both designed several shows for us. Um, so we have Sar Sarah O'Halloran, who most recently um, designed The Brother Size and composed The Brother Size and Swimming with Whales. And we have um, Ethan Ballas, who uh, did Farnsworth and Trying. Um, but that is not all that they are limited to. I, I kind of stuck with the, the latest two um, because they've certainly done quite a few shows for us. And um, we're going to be speaking with them today. We're going to be talking about sound, composition of sound, and the role that they play in creating that. Um, my first question actually doesn't have much to do with theater at all because I found um, a common through line for all of you, and that is that you are all music composers, and that is where you started. So my first question is just as um, getting to know you, who is or who are your favorite composers? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan should answer. <laughs> Um, good question. Uh, to be honest, I, I mostly listen to uh, like rock music, so um, the Beatles and Radiohead. Um, uh, there's a, actually a band from DC called Jawbox um, that I really like. Um, in classical composers, I really like Claude Debussy. He's uh, probably my favorite classical composer. Um, and I'm I'm also like really interested in people who only did songwriting. So like Carol King and Norman Whitfield and those kind of songwriters of the 60s and 70s, um, uh, I find really fascinating and kind of inspiring. Um, and uh, Billy Joel as well. <laughs> um, so I think that's probably a good list. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Sarah. <laughs> Whenever someone asks me my favorite of anything, my mind goes like completely blank. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are some American composers that are living and working right now who I really like, um, like Michael Gordon and David Lang. Um, who else? Uh, I like a lot of um, minimal and post-minimal music, so people like Philip Glass, who's done a lot of movie scores. Um, there's a Dutch composer called Louis Andreessen, who does these big weird operas that are absolutely fabulous um and i spent quite a lot of my younger days um studying the work of an irish composer called gerald barry who specializes in opera and um i'm probably the world expert on gerald barry which is not useful but um i did enjoy listening to his music and writing about it a great deal um his music doesn't have any electronics. It's, it's all orchestras and voices. Um, it tends to be very, very fast and very, very loud and very strange and very gay. Um, he's pretty great. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's so eclectic. Both of you have such an eclectic um, favorites, like your favorites. Would, your, no one would understand your playlist. <laughs> <laughs> Or figure out how exactly to dance to it because it's so eclectic, so many different sounds and different voices. Um, so what event on your journey as, as a human in this universe led you to want to compose music? Good question. Um, my parents, who I actually think might be on this call, they, uh, they're always very encouraging. They bought me a, a songwriting software when I was younger. But writing music was always a thing. Like I, I feel like I, um, I have an early memory of like writing music when I was four, just like wow. a song about Mr. Hooper, or, you know, from Sesame Street or whatever. And um, uh, so it was always a thing that happened. And um, and it's at this point like it's it's more of a it's it's almost like a reflex in some ways. Um, I have I've dreamed a number of songs like it's just it's just something that exists and it's, it, I can't not write music I can only not write it down you know I don't really have an option not to write it so um, so and I often don't write it down but um, but um, but yeah it's it's a uh, it's something that is um, it's just something that's always been there and because it's always been there I've 
turned it into something to do intentionally, basically. Beautiful. How about you, Sarah? Kind of similar. Um, I think I always used to make up little songs um, from a pretty early age. Um, maybe something kind of key that happened for me was um, when I was about 16 or 17, um, in the town that I lived in, there was this um, arts festival, which used to take place over the Easter break. And at some point they decided to commission a composer and two uh, musicians to do this series of workshops all winter long and to work with like student composers of any age. So it was like, I think there were two teenagers and there was someone of about 30 and there were someone of about 70 and, and it was, you know, five or six people. Um, and we studied with this composer and we tried out writing a piece and we got to write it for these professional musicians. And I think that was when I decided I wanted to study music in college for sure, because I'd always kind of had a feeling I wanted to do that, but um, it felt realistic after that. That's beautiful. I'm going to ask each of you a specific question. Ethan, do you remember the lyrics to your song for Mr. Hooper on Sesame Street? I, I believe it was just Mr. Hooper. And that was it like, over and over again. <laughs> that was the start of it. But I think it was passion, you know. If you were a four-year-old, um, that's great. If you were a 16-year-old, we should probably talk. <laughs> probably not the best song, yeah. But it had a distinct melody, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Sarah, you actually play a musical instrument, is that true? Not if people are watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are, um, you trained, it's a, you trained as a musician, so I'm, I'm curious, like, was there a specific? There I mean, there, there was. Um, <laughs> In college, I was a vocalist, and um, I ended up actually getting injured, so I stopped. Mm. And I think that was for the best because I was a very, very, very nervous performer, and I think it would have led to alcoholism if I had to try to be a professional singer. I do occasionally sing on um, on tracks for shows because um, I get to record them all alone in my basement. <laughs> And then the other thing that I do is that um, I haven't done it much recently, but I used to when I was in my PhD and for a couple of years after I used to create a lot of um, interactive electronic instruments that I would perform on. You can wow. hear buzzes and beeps and noises. Interactive electronic sounds. That, that's exciting. Have it you went used? wrong a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. So that uh, leads me to my next question was, um, as a music composer, as a person who composes music and, and, and uses voice to compose sound and songs, how did you find yourself adding sound designer for theater to uh, your tree? How did you make that a branch on your tree? Me? Um, oh, yeah, sorry. So for me, it was kind of seamless. I had been involved in theater, you know, like as a kid. And then I, I worked as a theater technician while I was in college running lights for a theater company. And I'd always wanted one sound, but um, my boss didn't care about sound. So he put the person he trusted most on lights. Um, but a lot of my musical training um, comes from a sort of experimental music tradition. And so I did a lot of like, making music where you record weird sounds from the world and you chop them up and make a piece out of them or things of that description. Um, so in my training in music, a lot of the skills that you use to make music of that kind are the same as what you would do for theater. It's just like the end result is slightly different or the goal is slightly different. Um, so when it came to coming back into theater um, to work in sound, it was just a question of things like understanding the the jargon of like hold and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Ethan? Yeah, um, so I like growing up, I, I, I am a singer, so I came to things more from a singing standpoint and was a, in like high school, I was did more performing in college. So, um, uh, but really, like the most fun part for me was the writing and arranging. Like that was always my favorite part of things. Um, and so, um, and I don't. I'm not. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, I'm a professional musician in the sense that I'm writing stuff, and this is a professional year. But like, that's not my full time 
uh, job. And, um, and I, and I had been doing it and been writing stuff and like, basically it's just sat on my computer. Um, and, uh, I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I need to, I need to find an outlet for this and talking to people. And they thought the theater would be a good outlet, especially for the type of music that I write. It, it is, it can be more atmospheric and, and, and that kind of thing. And so I, um, so I, you know, just got one show under my belt and, and kind of use that to do some more shows. And, and that's kind of where we are uh, today. So that's how I got into it. That same, same thing with Sarah, that like the terminology, the terminology still throws me off. I don't, <laughs> I still have to be like, what is, what does that mean? Like, what does that uh, direction mean? Cause I don't you know. I just, the terminology, I'm not. I have the same problem. Alex uh, translates for me a lot when I'm directing. <laughs> when I'm talking to the designers, I, I know how to talk as an actor, <laughs> but sometimes it, it is a different language. Yeah. Um, and it changes too, I think, as, as we evolve as an art mm -hmm. form. Um, so I, I'm going to combine two questions, so, so bear with me now. So uh, we talked about the idea of, of sound being um, a character, a, a silent character um, in the production. So what clues do you use? I mean, you know, we, we know you have to talk to the director, but outside of that, what clues do you use in developing this character? And then how do you then expand that character to a soundscape? First. You're first. <laughs> Me? Um, I, I always feel like um, when a script can give you something for free, you should embrace it. Um, so sometimes a script might have like a light motif um, that occurs a lot of times. And so that's like, we'll say, a structural element where you try to think to yourself, how could I use music to echo that structure as we develop the story. That's kind of what I did <clears throat> in the case of um, when the rain stops falling. I think I, that was a, a play where sort of like the same, the same things keep happening to different generations of people. And so I tried to use music that was made of the same core elements, but kind of came out differently every time. And then um, in something like Swimming with Whales, in that case, I chose sort of like an actual character from the play, which was the whale. Mm -hmm. And so we had this magical whale that um, a person in the play could hear singing. And so I found whale song that I liked. And I tried my, I transcribed it roughly. Like I figured mm -hmm. out like what more or less what notes are in this sequence. And then um, I use those as like a basic building block to make things for the transitions. And in the case of that play, I always have to give myself a reason to do something. I can't just be like, I'm going to write some music just to make something beautiful that does not exist for me. I always have to have a reason why. So I was like, okay, so the character that dies at the beginning of the play played guitar. In, I think by the time we got the play on the stage, guitar was not in the script anymore, but it was in a version of the script. So I was like, great, I'm going to imagine him sitting on his, at, on his porch in his little beach house playing his guitar. It's going to be based on this whale. Boom. Done. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> it sounds so easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think a um, yeah, similar thing. I mean, like, part of it really has to do with what, what the goal kind of, it, I think that the sound is really, it's, when you when you're on the design part of the theater, everyone's on a team, and I think that's one thing I, I've loved about it the most is that everyone's on a team. And luckily, I've every production I've done with First Stage and other companies, everyone has been on the team. Like everyone has worked together and like talked about what the vision is, and and um, you get into these really weird esoteric conversations, of like how real is this scene, like and like. Um, and I remember like a question I asked when we did trying because it's just a two-person state play it was like are we always here right like is the sound gonna take so like there's a lot of talk about things that happened in the past does the sound take us outside of the now and the answer we said was no it's always going to be here and then that just kind of limits what you what you do in some ways which is a good thing you kind of want limits um, from a music perspective, um, um, I tend to, 
it, it's part of that conversation of like, well, what is this about? So is this about, is it more about the characters or is it more about ideas? And if it's, so for trying, it was a two character play and both the characters had themes. Um, and I made sure that the themes could actually be played on top of each other. So uh, at the beginning of the play, the um, uh, Biddle, uh, his character is an older man, his theme is louder. And as the play goes on and he starts uh, kind of winding down or Sarah's personality is coming out and she's becoming stronger, I actually had his theme get quieter and quieter as the play went on and her theme get louder and louder as the play went on. Um, and I actually did not compose, like I only composed that, like, and, and it changed throughout the play so it sounded different in different sections, but it was basically the same song throughout the entire play. In the Farnsworth invention, it was much more about ideas and the two ideas that we talked about were like information and invention. And so anytime that there was kind of an invention type conversation going on that needed music, the invention theme came up and then the information and kind of uh, happened, uh, that theme came up. I, I even um, ended up using the information theme to like write a, in a completely different genre of music. It was like this jazz, uh, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it was like this kind of like up-tempo jazz piece in the middle of this party, because it was like a party. And so you need background music for a party. So it's like, you have this functional thing, but I'm not gonna just choose some random music. And so because it was a party for NBC, I was like, well, I'll use the information theme music and I'll actually um, turn it into this jazz piece. Um, so you kind of, it's, a, it's like a puzzle and you're trying to do multiple things at once, right? And, and like, so you're trying to accomplish something with the character and the mood, but you're also trying to, you develop this, you know, like you call it a character or a language or whatever it is, and you, you're trying to develop it enough. And you also at the same time know that the audience like, shouldn't be paying attention to what you're doing, right? Like, it, like unless it's like, I'm gonna turn on the jukebox and music is coming out, or like I'm, you know, in the non-music stuff, I'm gonna turn on the faucet and water's coming out, right? Like they really shouldn't know that you're doing what you're doing and they should kind of feel it. Um, and, and which I love, I love doing the thing that's powerful and affects people and they have no idea that I'm doing it to them. It's kind of, it's kind of like mischievous or whatever, but um, so that's, that's kind of how I, I developed those for those two projects. Wow, thank you both. You both mentioned something along the same lines in terms of, Sarah, you said, you know, the script gives, gives you things. Sometimes they give you the sound effects. It's right there in there. And then sometimes there are plays that actually have music um, that you, that they want played. It's mentioned, it, it's a part of the, the time that the play was written or the era that the, the play exists. So when you have uh, plays where it's given. It's either given in the, the text, it's a, a sound effects it, it itself. Um, how do you, or do you, add your own personal little flavor to it, even though it's still inherent in the text? Or do you at all? Um, it depends. I Sometimes people suggest things in the text mm -hmm. and Sometimes they should be ignored. <laughs> like we've, de I've definitely, I'm sure all of us have worked on plays where you're like, okay, you're a very good writer, you're not a good sound designer. <laughs> so there are times when you'll ignore them, and you'll try to go with maybe like more so the intention than what they specifically said. But yeah, I mean, there are times where just doing what they ask for is enough. Like you can't do Heidi Chronicles without using the songs that she asks you to. Um, however, you can be creative in things like, where are you putting them in the space? And how are you EQing them? Um, that can make a big difference, you know, cause like there's, I did Heidi Chronicles in the round and Heidi Chronicles is just like the story of a lady's life. And there's a moment where she goes to a school dance. And so, you know, I, I put the sound where the dance was happening in that specific area of the stage. So if you're far away from it, it's not as loud for you as the people who are close to it, which is like breaking a rule in theater, but it's, 
it's a more realistic experience mm -hmm. for, and for that that's appropriate it's you know um and eqing is EQing is a very important scale where you would be balancing the sound for the speakers that you have and the room that you're in um, and trying to make it optimal for everybody. And sometimes if characters are speaking over a track, you have to, you know, notch out a little space for them in the sound to make sure that they can be understood and that they can be heard, whether or not they're using a microphone. And I like the technical challenges of it. Um, I think there's a creativity in there. I think I'll ring a doorbell and be quite happy about it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not, I don't have too much to add to what Sarah said because that's exactly what I feel as well. The only thing, I, the only other thing I would add is um, not only the location, but sometimes it's like if it's coming through a radio, like it really, like that's the idea, and you need to figure out like what does that sound like? How old is this radio? Mm -hmm. What you know. And, and there is a little bit of like weird artistry to that, like in terms of like what, what type of radio would this person have, um, you know, um, and uh, really kind of figuring out, um, yeah, like what is, um, we, had, we had something in, in trying where there was like a telephone ringing and I was like, like what, <laughs> how, do, how do I do research on what a telephone sounded like in, the 1950s or 60s, 60s or whatever like how do you how do you know that right so like kind of figure those kind of things out like what is that what does that sound like and again like put like sarah said putting it in the space so it's not coming from some speaker far away it's coming from the telephone even though the telephone wasn't actually ringing i think it's something that needs to happen you know it's like otherwise people are like why is why is it why is the phone ringing behind me and they're looking behind them alex do you remember our crying monster baby from trevor <laughs> when your budget is low and you have to make a baby that people can carry around very close to the audience that cries that gets real interesting <laughs> <laughs> did you, how did you um how did you solve that sarah uh, the, the uh we got very lucky we got away with using a very cheap bluetooth speaker and it that that was that was a risky move on our part, but we did have a backup for the um, the stage manager where she could have played it through the speakers if she absolutely had to. Um, but it did work on that occasion. There are more expensive ways that, of doing it that work better, but sometimes <laughs> you have to make it work. Yeah. Ethan, you had uh, with trying um, the dick phone. Yeah. You want to uh, talk yeah. about that a little bit? And uh, Sarah mentioned that there was a backup plan. So how did you ultimately deal with phone sound and then yeah. what was the backup? Yeah, we were props to the pops department for finding a microphone. Because I think it worked the majority of the time. Um, anyway, in not a new device. Um, but we had a dictaphone on stage, and the idea was that one character records rewinds the dictaphone and plays it and ideally we would do that for real um and so um but we but like i was like i am not as much as this i've seen it work i know it works i can't trust it to work and so just like like sarah said you build like a second um you, you build a, a like a a line that you don't plan to use but is there for the stage manager to use if not, and so what I did was I had the character record it into the dictaphone, and then I recorded the playing from the dictaphone, and then put that file into the sound design plan, and then put like big X's like don't use unless needed, like kind of like a uh, fire, you know, don't break unless there's an emergency kind of thing. Um, and so yeah, I think there were like, a couple of performances where it was needed, and it was there to to use uh, and. And so it sounded like a real dictaphone because it was a real dictaphone sound. Awesome. So I have um, a question for you guys personally um, on this side of a, a global pandemic. Um, how have you been able to um, use your creative uh, energy to, to, to remain um, viable, a viable artist? And what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing in your craft? 
Um, I, I think like uh, I'm giving myself assignments of things since I'm not, I don't have assignments to do. Um, uh, working on projects that started a while ago and kind of finishing them. Um, um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, yeah, I, a couple a couple songs I wrote. Actually, a, a song I wrote totally outside of theater. Um, my my eight year old daughter is kind of into computer programming, so we're making like an animated music video together. Oh, cute. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna see how that works out. Um, but uh, just kind of keeping busy, you know, ma making sure like um, yeah, I, don't know. I, I think like it like what I what I found is that I work best when I give myself assignments, even if they're not real assignments. Um, uh, it's kind of I work a lot faster and more efficiently that way. Sarah? I am supposed to be working on a musical. Um, <laughs> I'm not really. Uh, in, in our case, you know, the pandemic means that we have no childcare, uh, which has worked out okay in that um, my husband is, is still working full time and I'm not. So I'm available to look after a kid. Um, and you know, I'd love to work more at the weekends, but there, for some various reasons, there hasn't been much option to do that either. Uh, but, you know, I'm doing, trying to do creative things with my kids for, you know, to have some fun. Um, we're gardening, we're painting kitchen cabinets, uh, stuff like that, just to keep busy. Um, and I am working on one theatre project at the moment, um, which I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about. Uh, <laughs> it, yeah, I'm working on something with only Theatre Centre, um, which is being done remotely. Um, so I'm trying to squeeze that in at the moment. It's mostly in the evenings, which is, which is tiring, but it's good. You both kind of mentioned um, that you sing. I did at some point. So I have a creative question for you. I'm going to ask you to create something as you hear it in your head. <laughs> With your voice, um, if you could orchestrate with your voice, what is going on in the world today? <laughs> what would that sound like? Go. Mm. Like, what would that, uh, you know, in my head, I'm thinking a scat, but that's just my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how vocally, how, how could you, what would you compose vocally? Um, in light of all that's going on in the world today, like not with words, just sound. Not with words. I had something with words. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 fine, fine. How terrible of me as as an artistic <laughs> thing to limit your creativity. Yeah. So yeah. with words, then no, either or. Mine is not very creative. It's just Black Lives Matter. <laughs> that's all I've got at the moment. I cannot disagree with you there. <laughs> How about you, Ethan? Um, I think there would be um, there would be something that was going with like and that would be part of it and then um, and then you would have like a, um, 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 there would be a part of it just like like and then and then you'd have another part that'd be like and then you have another part that's just like, yeah, oh, yeah. So something like that, like all combined together, I think would sum up everything that's going on. But I feel like you can make that layer it enough. It'd be a uh, comprehensible. I love how you had the choreography to go. Yeah, with you got to have choreography. Like, yeah. <laughs> that was really great. Um, <laughs> Emily, I believe we have a question from our audience. We do, yes. Um, uh, so I have, the first question that I have is for Sarah, and I've been asked to ask it. Um, mm -hmm. How long did it take to transcribe the whale song from Swimming with Whales, and have you done that with other animal sounds before? Um, not very long, because it wasn't a super long um, piece of audio, probably half an hour. And have you used... Um, transcription of animal sounds before or have you used to remember. them as like um, inspiration for things? 
Uh, I haven't done a ton of animal sound transcription, but I've definitely used a lot of animal sounds in um, sort of like, oh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, like ambiance type compositions. So is not the word that I need, but I can't think of it. Um, soundscapes. That's it. So a lot of plays that I work on, I love combining music with sounds from the world. Um, I bet Ethan does too. Awesome. Um, and I have another question. This one's for Ethan. Um, regarding what a phone uh, ring from a certain time period sounds like, um, and this is actually really for both of you, um, how does a sound designer work uh, with a show's dramaturg, or if there mm -hmm. is one? Um, is that often a collaboration that happens? Um, there was, I feel like on I feel like most person I work with, the person I work with the most uh, is actually the props person um, to just kind of have conversations because sometimes they they have done research that I don't want to redo um, uh, in terms of like, or it's like, you know, they try to get a phone from the 1950s and they got one from the 1960s and you just try to like match what's realistic about that phone. Um, so I, I think there's, that's really the person I've talked to the, the most. Um, the one good thing about like modern times and having YouTube and stuff like that is that you could, you can at least be like, let me see this scene from a movie in the 1940s that has a phone ringing in it. You know, like you can get some sort of at least area. Um, and, 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 and because it's sound, because um, it's, a, it's a weird thing in that like nobody's paying attention, but if it's wrong, people notice. You just kind of sometimes have to be like, well, I don't want to be wrong, right? Like, I don't have to be perfectly right, but if I'm wrong, if, if this sounds like, you know, some sort of digital phone from the 1990s, right? Like, it's going to be, it's, it's going to strike people wrongly. If it sounds like, uh, you know, a rotary phone from the 1970s instead of a rotary phone from the 1950s, I don't think anyone's going to be freaking out about that and like notice that I did something wrong. Um, and so you do the best you can. And then at some point you just have to, you just have to say, you have to let go and be like, I don't think anyone's going to cry about this. I've had some funny situations with that. I did a play um, at the Atlas Theater in DC where uh, there, we had to use Israeli um, siren for police. And the venue gets a lot of street noise so as the performance progressed i kept getting notes about the siren was wrong and seen whatever um there was no siren in the play it was in the <laughs> street and i was like i'm sorry i can't change the traffic <laughs> that's great um ethan i wanted to let you know that i do see your lovely parents here on the call <laughs> Um, and you, you talked about that your parents were kind of responsible for, um, you know, starting you on your journey as a composer. And I'm wondering if you know, um, or if they want to even speak on what was it they saw in you that, you know, that caused them to, to make that investment in you that caused them to, to say, wow, you know, where did, was your cry more harmonious or mellifluous <laughs> than any other child? Um, you know, what, what was it in you that they saw that, you know, in, inspired them to, to start you on your way? That's a great question. I mean, they probably would know more than me, but um, the, um, uh, we're, you know, we, we did a lot of music. We sang a lot and stuff like that at home all the time. And they're, they're both my parents are really into music. And so the thought of the bad, and I was, and I was singing, so I was doing plays and things like that. I also like don't ask for anything. Like I don't, I, I, it's not, it's never been a thing. Like I asked for a gift and I think I may have even asked for something like that. And, and they were like, knew it was a big deal because I asked for it. Um, uh, but I mean, I'm also, I mean, I'm also fortunate. My, I went to the public high school in Maryland that had just a tremendous music and theater program. And I, 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 mean, I personally know like a lot of people who continued on either in a professional sense or a, or just as a continued passion of theirs, doing stuff in music and theater. It's a very, um, like a lot of people that I was in plays and stuff with still do it, like still are in plays 
still sing, are in bands, do acting on television, write, um, things like that. It's, it's a very, um, probably a lot larger percentage of the people that I know st are still involved because the program was so good and it was so encouraged and it was supported by, uh, I think a lot of people's parents were really supportive, and mine included, uh, of just doing art, like it, it was important. Um, and so again, thanks to my parents for, for, for that. And um, um, yeah, so it, it, it was great. Okay, Emily, you have some more questions. I do, yeah, I have a question for, uh, from Carla. So I'm gonna unmute, I'm asking now. Let's see if that'll, such a fun, there we go, Carla. Okay. <laughs> Um, since your area of expertise revolves around sound and music, do you find that when you go to watch a play that you're not involved with, that you are focusing on those aspects to the exclusion of the storyline? That's great. Uh, not the exclusion, but I'm definitely looking for things I could steal. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's wonderful to go and listen to a play that has been worked on by a really good sound designer, a really good composer, because it's lovely to learn. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, unless it's unless it's really bad, I don't get distracted. You know, like unless it's like um, uh, in plays and movies too. Um, uh, movie like sound mixing, where it's like the action scene is. Uh, 80 times louder than the talking scene when you're like, it actually, it should probably be reversed. I don't need, <laughs> <laughs> like I need to hear what they're saying. It seems to be more important. Um, but, but just I, ideas for, um, you know, I, I, like I, I would say I probably watch a lot more movies and television than go to plays. So that's more of my ex experience. Um, uh, and just like kind of hearing what is done and interestingly like you know you're aware of it i think you're probably aware of it more than the average person but it's i i try not to be distracted by it and i also marvel at like simple ideas especially simple ideas that like you're just like yeah uh, like jaws for example is probably an example that most people would know it's like it's two notes right and like the movie doesn't exist without those two notes and it, like, as far as like a very present score, it is the, the best big present score to me because it's just like, without it, you don't know the shark is coming, right? Um, uh, and then there's, set, there's a way more subtle ones that are just like, um, uh, you just marvel at the, the, really it's more like the idea of it. It's like one, that you like it because the music is good, but when it's just like, why that song came in there and you're like oh my gosh that is just it's just brilliant it's just someone someone really knew what the scene was about what the emotion was about and they brought it up and sometimes it's not like the first thing i hear the first thing i notice or anything but like you think about it afterwards and you go back more and be like oh yeah like that's why that worked i occasionally get distracted by bitterness um, because sometimes I'll be at a play where the sound is not good. And I'll think to myself, I would not get away with that. How did he get away with that? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, it can kind of feel like when you have high standards, um, people raise their expectations of you, mm -hmm. um, sometimes beyond what is what there is time for. And so sometimes I'll go to things and be like, no, seriously, how do you get away with that sloppy stuff? Because sometimes I'm <laughs> tired. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <laughs> so I have another question here that I'm going to ask um, because I'm really curious about this one. Um, have you, either of you, uh, been called by a script to, um, like, to have a historically... Uh, you know, has the historically accurate sound ever felt like the wrong sound for the show? So you changed it. Question. That's a great question. Wow. Uh, I guess, I guess, yes. I mean, two, one, one really specific thing um, may answer our previous question, but there was a show I did 
that had like a specific song from a specific artist. And I listened to it and I was like, this is, this is, this is wrong. Like it doesn't, it doesn't fit the scene at all. Um, so I actually found another song by the same artist and put it in um, because I was like, this is more correct. I, wa I want to honor the vision and like, this is the music that this person listens to, but like, I'm, this is a transition music to the next scene and like it breaks the mood if I choose the song that they wanted to choose. So I've definitely done that. Um, I think like, I'm trying not to give a super long answer to this, but I, th I think with, with, when you think about like a television or, or movie, the idea is to do an illusion that seems real, right? But when you do a play, you do an illusion that everybody watching knows is an illusion. Right, like you know, you're not in that room. You know, you're, you know, you're not that there isn't really a whale. Right, it's not, it's not real. Right, so it's like it's um, the the historically accurate choice is only the choice you make if that's what you're trying to do. If you're trying to make a historically accurate recreation where it's like someone's firing a gun and it's like. A, you really want it to sound like a battlefield, you make it sound like a battlefield. But if you want it to feel like a battlefield, right? Um, and the rest of the play is very illusiony and it's not very realistic. Mm -hmm. Like using a historically added battlefield sound would be wrong, right? Like they yeah. you want it to feel a certain way. Real and convincing are very different. Yes. And <laughs> An awkward thing that has come up for me a couple of times is uh, when you work with a director who has a very, um, what they wish for is what you would get in a movie. But what, but they are under the impression that what happens in a movie is real. And so sometimes I'll be presenting options to a director and they're very disappointed by all of them. And I'm like, well, you asked me for a real, I don't know, gun. This is what a real gun actually sounds like. Like this is a recording of the exact gun that they're using. And they're like, but it sounds like nothing. And I'm like, it does sound like nothing. Would you like me to make you something that is good? That is compelling. <laughs> um, just because it's, it's not what people are imagining when they imagine, you know, the gunman appears out of nowhere and shoots someone. It, it needs to be a big, huge moment. So like if you're doing a gunshot in a play and you want it to be good, you're probably using five gunshots and a cannon. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. I love that. Um, so here is a question about um, sort of the composer side of both of your brains. Um, I imagine, though I'm not a composer, that you're often uh, out in the world and ideas come to you. Um, how do you, what is your style, each of you, um, to put the music that lives in your head somewhere that you can remember it? Is it a note memo? Or is it a voice memo? Is it a notebook? How do you, how do you do that? I like a voice memo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jump out of the shower, grab my phone. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, walking is walking is a big thing. Um, I actually I used to walk for my commute. I was way more creative then. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, it just happens. Um, voice memo. Before that, like before um, that technology existed, I didn't have like a dictaphone, and I would just I would write down because I don't have perfect pitch, so I would I would write down like a relative pitch. Uh, stuff so I wouldn't forget it because I, I tend to like not forget music I hear but I music I create um, which is very weird um, um, and so I would write it down I actually and then I would keep all the pieces of paper because for some reason I find I, there's magic to those pieces of paper um, I was doing without going into too much explanation I was I was helping out I did used to do job training type stuff and I was helping out someone in a janitorial position and uh, a song came to me, and, and so I still have it. It's a paper towel with uh, notes written on it. Um, and that turned into a song. It actually turned into a, a song that I recorded with my band many years ago. That's awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about how um, uh, the design team is very much hopefully a team that is really supportive and, and feels team-like. 
Um, but how much do you as sound designers, and this must vary by process, interact with the actors? For example, Sarah, how much of the soundscape that the actors created in the brothers' size was sound design? They sang a decent amount. Um, so in that case, I kind of interacted with them in two ways. They let me record them reading a play, um, which I, I do sometimes if you're planning to do a lot of underscoring, you know, which is where there's music under the speech. Um, because I find that people's rhythms don't change that much. The tone of their voice is certainly not going to change. So um, I find that to be a helpful way of, of working on underscoring. And then um, they each sent me a little recording of them singing, which I used as a reference for composing for them. And then we worked together a little bit. We simplified the parts that were too hard. We bumped up the things that they were good at and that they felt comfortable with. And then um, in some situations, we combined electronics, like some of the electronics had a reference pitch to help them find their starting note mm. um, and things like that. That was, I mean, that, oh, that kind of play, I would do it every week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just every single thing that I enjoy doing was in it. And then it's like a really interesting play on top of it. The actors were phenomenal. Everybody was oh, just, mm. yeah. Ethan? Yeah, I mean, uh, timing is certainly something that you deal with the actors a, a lot. Um, so I think a lot of it is you catering to them as opposed to them catering to you. But every once in a while, there is a like, you do request, can the scene be two seconds longer because the note would finish, you know, kind of thing. Um, for, I did a pr production of Macbeth last year that was very sound heavy. Um, and we actually had to record the, they, they didn't, the witches in Macbeth were never on stage. And so we recorded the, all the actors saying all these different lines and then layered them and did stuff. So that was like a lot more time with the actors in terms of, um, just getting that and then and then mixing and then play and then as we're rehearsing playing with what's going to be live what's going to be done we have someone talk on stage and have it seem like it's echoing but, but it's not really echoing it's kind of pretend echoing um, so there was a lot more work in that and then, and then there are times when it's not it's, it's not as heavy you know working with the actors I love doing voiceover sessions with the actors I just love it yeah I, and I, I particularly love it when, um, if me and the director kind of know each other already and I know kind of their aesthetic and they just let me do it because some directors are fantastic in a voiceover session and some are asking for things that make sense when you can see the actor. Um, so sometimes I've started asking for like, okay, do it the director's way. And then I'm like, can I have three takes or I tell you what to do? And then we can pick the director's favorite because the director's the boss. We'll get their favorite. But sometimes just when you're the one listening and you know how the mic works, you're like, I think I can get you something you're going to like even more. Mm. But it's so fun to work with actors on, on voiceovers. It's, mm. oh, love it. Yeah, that's awesome. And we often have fun trying to find space in the first stage theater for <laughs> everybody y'all to, to get together because there's never enough space or there's never enough quiet space. Um, I think that there is never a moment of quiet in first stage. <laughs> um, so it's always a fun challenge. It's the case everywhere. I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so um, I have a question actually for me. Um, so, um, Sound is really important to invoking feeling. I, you know, you've, I, I think some people have seen those videos that you see of, of, you know, horror movies, but without the sound, right? And it's like, you just, you're not as invested. Um, you're not leaning forward, you're kind of leaning back. And so obviously it's, it's really important to evoking feeling. So um, what's in your way, what's your, what is either of your way in producing feeling or getting access to um, the types of emotion or um, feeling or driving force that you're looking for if it is a play um, that has experiences that you maybe haven't had. Like for example, mm -hmm. Brother Size is about um, 
you know, uh, two African American brothers um, dealing with um, incarceration and family and mythology. And so, um, can you talk a little bit about trying to create a soundscape for some thing uh, that you might not personally have access to necessarily? Brother Size is a big research play. Um, and it was a fun type of research. Um, you know, so we were able to, we research, I went to um, like folk music archives to get samples of the kind of music that, you know, Brother Size is based on some, um, I think it's, is it Igbo legends? Some African legends. It's been a while since I've read the play, so I, I, don't, I don't remember the research that well. But, you know, I found out where are some of these um, icons coming from and what music is associated with the people that came up with those stories. So I found some of that. I listened to, you know, various kinds of music that um, were American and, you know, like things associated with the bayou, um, various kinds of blues and jazz. Um, and then also the more recent popular music that they actually refer to in the play. Um, and so in that one, I ended up trying to make a sort of collage of the African and the Black American elements that are the core to what the play actually kind of is. Um, so I did a lot of electronic sampling because I felt that that was maybe more appropriate and more respectful than me as like a white composer being like, I'm going to write some Black music now. Um, and I think that gave us some space to, to be very creative. So like there were, there were times when African drumming was layered on top of, um, what's that song that they refer to? Come on over to my place. So I took some samples from that song and really abstracted them. And so there's this like very erotic moment where the men are in prison and they're having this romantic situation. And it's this combination of African drumming and this pop music that's been highly abstracted and some drones and it's very rich and dense. Um, and that's the kind of situation where like, yes, the details of the play are foreign to me. Like I'm not a black man on the down low with his friend, but like, you know, we can all understand the romantic attachment to another person. We can all understand the, um, the stress and strains of family. And then, you know, in the parts that are so foreign to me, like the, they're harassed by the police in this play. Um, you have to just ask people and listen. Uh, we have very little time, but Ethan? Oh, I don't know if I have a lot to add to that. I mean, I think that's, that's the good advice. I mean, you, um, there are certain things that are way more universal than I think we admit, you know, and, I, and, and that we can all tap into if we allow ourselves. And there are certain things that you don't, and you just need to do the research and talk to people and, yeah. and figure out what makes sense. That's amazing. Thank you. I, uh, I've really appreciated being able to be a small part of this conversation and I'm obviously going to throw it back over to Deirdre to, to bring it on home. I want to thank you both and, and thank you all for being here with us today. Um, our last in our series of uh, virtual community conversations. Um, I'm, I, I hope all of you um, will listen out or look for our news on Monday about the classes that we are launching. That will be six weeks. So um, we are, we're, not, we're not disappearing. We are doing something uh, additional to, uh, to the community conversations, but we're furthering a part of our mission statement, which is uh, uh, connecting with our community in, in very important ways as artists. And one of them is going to be with our, our new classes that we're launching, and we are going to announce those on Monday. And I certainly want to thank Ethan and Sarah. Um, I think music is, is the universal language. And, you know, I love what, you know, that the question that Emily asked, which is so important, if you, if you don't have a background, what do you do um, in, in creating this soundscape? And as sound, and you talked about that sound is that invisible character, well, you have to do the same thing an actor has to do. You have to go in and do your, do your research and, and figure out that composition. So that was really great to hear that. And brother size and trying, I, I was with Ethan, um, 
as he started with trying and, and certainly was able to hear how it evolved, which was really phenomenal. And then I saw the brother's eyes and I have to say that the music, I was at the first rehearsal, but then I didn't see it again until the show. And I have to say that the sound and what you create now, Teddy Pendergrass is a huge favorite of mine. So what you did with that song and those drums was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty happy with it. I, I was very happy with it. Um, but thank you all. This has been great. Um, First Stage is nothing without its family. And you all have hung in there. Um, so many repeat faces on this call. And just really excited that Ethan's parents, I'm just going to keep saying that. <laughs> That's just so beautiful to me. It's like you're a fully grown man and your parents are, are still here supporting you, which is great. Um, Kathy uh, is is, is with us who's been with us and so many other people Alex is here even though he's quiet um, and his hair is curly and long um, but thank you all so much we are just going to take a little pause from the community conversations again and but we're asking you to, to look for the classes and uh, hopefully something um, that we're offering will be something that titillates you and you'll want to sign up and, and, and take a class with us. So have a great day. Enjoy your day. We love you and we look forward to seeing you in all the many virtual ways that we are working out to still have you be a part of our family.